Great. Um, just I want to introduce myself very quickly. Uh, I'm Tom Gemmel, and I'm a um, former fighter pilot in the Air Force. Spent a lot of time uh, training people on weapon systems and various technologies that now are making their way into uh, advanced air um, robotics as well as um, aircraft systems. Um, the uh, co-leader of my firm is uh, on the aircraft system and advanced robotics uh, practice group. Um, Clients, uh, a, 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 a range of clients involved in mean, aircraft systems, are agriculture, communications, utilities, um, movie and television, resort properties, and universities as well. Um, and uh, my colleague? Hi, I'm Spencer Wood. I'm a partner at Wilson LA as well. I work in, uh, I'm not a former fighter pilot, so nothing as exciting as that. Uh, but I work in our uh, tech transfer, tech licensing, and transactional practice group. Um, and I work with a lot of startups, uh, including some from U of I, and I've been very happy and excited to be involved with Enterprise Works and with uh, TPC for several years. I'm always impressed by the, uh, the innovation that's coming out of U of I, so we love coming down here. So we're going to talk to you a little bit about uh, unmanned aircraft systems. There's probably a variety of different uh, or spectrum of uh, experience that you guys have. Some of you are operating them right now, and others are just getting are very new to the technology. Uh, so this is going to be essentially sparking your interest, I hope. Um, and if you have questions, we're certainly going to take a deep dive into those areas that you have questions about, or can give you more um, broad uh, sense of how these systems are using. But we're, we're trying to get uh, you a flavor of unmanned aircraft systems, where they currently are, and uh, where they're going, both on a legal and technical, technological aspect. We could do on each one of the theories we're going to talk about um, entire presentations, which we've done before. Um, so if you have questions, uh, please let us know if you're going through it. Uh, but we'll try to get through most of this, and then at the end, we'll go ahead and open it up to questions uh, for you. So the variously called unmanned aircraft systems, uh, RPVs, UAVs, uh, they're as small as a dragonfly, as large as a 747. They're fixed-wing platforms. Uh, rotor platforms, but what they all have in common is <coughs> increased numbers and uses. And the reason why is they're safer, they reduce costs and induct increased uh, productivity, at least on the commercial side of it, and as a hobbyist, it's a lot of fun. It's a wide range of uses, you've seen this in the media. Over the years, it's a great increase in the numbers of uses. The ones that are currently being used, literally range in the industries from A to Z. A lot of them are the most of them that have been out there and that the most increase in terms of uh, requests for waivers and petitions and operations under Part 107, which is a small U.S. rules, come in three main areas right now, uh, actually just four, agricultural construction, real estate, and movie and television. Are there are a number of potential social applications for drones, ranging from cinematography, video shooting, journalism, oil and gas, and pipeline inspection, insurance, Real estate photography, or construction survey, for example, the department, adding a drone with a camera that you can fly over many acres in a short period of time uh, can really enhance the efficiency of that process. This next one is actually uh, one of our clients, but these are um, 3D modeling um, in virtual buildings. <laughs> Thank you. 
adjusted economic impact, and this was actually from a program that was uh, put out about three years ago. So we're thirteen and a half billion dollars in the first three years, and we're eighty-two billion in hundred thousand jobs in ten years. The current state of the law, as it applies to the hobbyists, or essentially or recreational, so you can fly these anywhere as long as you're complying with the community-based safety uh, guidelines. For example, the Academy of uh, Model Aeronautics puts out. Uh, on the commercial sense, though, you have to be able to have authorization from the FAA in order to operate um, drones. Under the FAA Modernization Reform Act of 2012, essentially Congress mandated the Department of Transportation and the FAA to integrate unmanned aircraft systems in their national airspace by September of 2015. Obviously, that didn't happen, but it pushed uh, put the impetus into getting it going. Uh, two sections in particular, Section 333 of the FMRA, um, goes to providing for an accelerated use through petitioning the FAA for a waiver, allowing you to operate uh, small drones in particular um, in advance of the overall rules that we put in place um, in the future. Section 336 goes to special rule for model aircraft and then essentially exempts any kind of model aircraft from being regulated. We'll talk about that in a little bit. In the recreational sense, uh, on the side, the uh, FMRA of 2012 says the FAA may not regulate any rule or, or uh, promulgate any rule or regulation regarding a model aircraft. Those are aircraft that are below 55 pounds, hobby recreational use only. You have to fly below 400 feet, and with, when you're within five miles of a heliport or an airport, you have to give the, um, the facility your notice that you're operating. The interpretation of this special rule, essentially anything uh, that is directly commercial or tangential to commercial is, uh, is not a hobbyist and therefore um, you have to be careful that you're not doing something for money. Um, the FAA came out with examples of the hobby commercial divide. So flying model aircraft at a, at a, a sports facility or recreational model aircraft club, well, that's okay, but if you do something like that for a demonstration for hire or for money, uh, then it's the commercial taking photographs of your um, using your property or flying around your airspace, uh, that's okay. But if you're a realtor and you're using that same um, example we gave earlier to list your property or to show it for commercial purposes, it's commercial use. Model aircraft, if you're going to fly something, uh, from, this is really important actually, if you pick it up and you fly from point A to point B, uh, you're doing it on your own and not getting paid to do so, that's okay. If you do it for money, however, it's not. Um, and then if you're looking at your own backyard or your own field for watering your plants, that's okay. But if you do it in a commercial farming context, it's considered commercial and you have to have FAA uh, authorization to do so. On the commercial side, uh, again, hobbyists, you can pretty much fly anywhere as long as you're following the guidelines and <coughs> certain restrictions. But on the commercial side, you have to have a specific authorization. It comes in three, the three areas generally. Part 107 came out last year, uh, the end of August, and that is a small UAS rule allowing you to operate small uh, vehicles. Section 333, we talked about that. If you can show that the FAA you're operating safely, um, they will give you a waiver to be able to operate your aircraft um, within the compliance of the FAA's rules. And then you get a certificate of authorization or waiver called a COA. You can operate your aircraft, and we'll explain just really quickly on how that goes. Part 107, it came out uh, at the end of last year. Um, the remote pilot certificate is required. It no longer requires you to be a pilot. So as long as you go through this knowledge test, you pass the knowledge test, it's recurring every two years. It gives you general sense of the airspace, how to operate in the airspace, and how to operate safely. You can do so as long as you're 16 years or older. Um, you know, you're required at this point to fly within visual line of sight, uh, so essentially two or three miles within, so you can see the aircraft depending on the aircraft side. Flying during the day, visual flight rules conditions, below 400 feet above the ground floor structure, so if you have a tower, it's um, within 400 feet of the top of the tower and along the sides. Uh, less than 100 miles per hour, and in uncontrolled airspace, you can fly without any air traffic control clearance or authorization. So you can go out and fly in uncontrolled airspace without having to talk to anybody. There are also waivers for ex uh, expansive use under Part 107 uh, for operations from a moving vehicle, um, a train, a car, a ship, uh, night operations beyond visual line of sight, they call BBLOS, for extended range, multiple aircraft being flown at one time by one controller, uh, directly flying over people's head, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, 
and beyond the aircraft limitations, so um, over 100 miles an hour, for example. Uh, the most prevalent waivers that have been granted at this point are Part 107. There's a lot of them. They get them every day, and a lot of these are being granted as long as you can prove that you're operating safely. Is night operations or twilight operations beyond visual line of sight using, for example, um, a daisy chain of visual observers, so you can actually go beyond the pilot control, but for further range beyond his, his or her visual line of sight. And one operator flying multiple aircraft. Section 333, this is essentially very similar, but it's for those types of aircraft that are beyond those that are covered by Part 107, and primarily it's uh, due to weight. So aircraft that weigh more than 55 pounds, these are, you have to have a pilot's license, at a minimum, a recreational sport license. Again, visual line of sight, day VFR conditions, operating within 400 feet of the ground itself, so it doesn't allow you to fly if there's a tower that's 200 feet still have to stay below 400 feet AGL above the ground. Less than 100 miles an hour, you also have to have a certificate of authorization or waiver in order to do so, identifying the time and place you're going to be flying, as well as the communications you'll have with air traffic control or FAA facilities. And also you have to send out what's called a Class D notice, of air, uh, notice to airmen that you're going to be operating in this particular airspace. So there's a little bit more restrictions and you have to have a pilot's license to fly under Section 33. Certificate of authorization or waiver. This is very interesting. This is essentially showing that your platform, the aircraft that you're flying, is airworthy. And it means that the platform goes through a whole series of testing. You have to submit the information to the FAA. And even though it's expedited, sometimes it can take up to 18, uh, 18 months, even three years, to, be get, to get your aircraft um, uh, airworthy certificate. You also have to show an injury is extremely improbable. The first two civil uh, COAs, the military has had them for a long time, and public aircraft it has COAs for a long time. But the first two civil COAs came out in 2014 for operations in the Arctic um, with BP and uh, Conoco. I think there's at least three that are very close to being certificated. So once those platforms like a Scanny or a Puma are certificated, then they're going to be, you and I can go out and we can operate these without the other op obligations or requirements that are required by the FAA. The FAA enforcement, if you don't have specific authorization in order to operate commercially, uh, they can assess a fine up to 27,500 uh, 27, per incident. That means every time you take off the land. Um, there are two uh, examples of that. One is a Perker case, which uh, sparked a lot of lawsuits that have happened since that point. It settled for less than $10,000, but it was a $10,000 initial uh, fine by the FAA. Skypan, you might have heard this, is about a year and a half ago now. They had 65 incidents in uh, Chicago as well as New York City in which they essentially were told they can't operate without a waiver uh, or authorization from the FAA, and they continued to do so, taking pictures around the city. They were eventually uh, they were fined $1.9 million. Um, and that is settled for a lot less. But the point is, the FAA is going to try to make examples of you if they have the wherewithal, the bodies to go out and find you. Uh, right now, they really don't have that capability. But if they do find you and you violate their rules after they tell you to stop, um, you might receive a letter in the mail. And then they have at enforcement actions. There's about three of them that are currently uh, before the administrative courts as well as the federal district courts um, that are working them themselves through. The FAA's timeline for integrating drones into our national airspace, again, they're supposed to do it by September 2015. It didn't happen. The small UAS rule, which is called Part 107, came out August of last year. The small UAS overflight rule, which I'll get into in a second, means you fly directly over people's heads, was supposed to happen by the end of 2016. It didn't happen. It's, it's, it should happen this year. And then the overall general rule, essentially integrating all aircraft, uh, various sizes of aircraft, not just, not just small on small drones, into the national airspace system is out for public notice sometime in 2018 to 2020. My guess is probably going to happen probably closer to 2020 because we're uh, fairly uh, fairly far behind. Future rulemaking. We talked about the small UAS rules. And there's four categories that they identify, essentially based on the defined level of risk, based on the size of the aircraft. We'll talk about that very quickly. But there's four categories that you can directly fly over the top of people's heads, and that was developed by what's called a micro um, uh, rulemaking committee. 
Category one, these are considered micro drones, very small, less than one half of a pound. The chance of serious injury is very low, and they're essentially putting no level, uh, they see there's no level of risk of serious injury, and as a result, they're allowing you to fly over people's heads directly. And then when that roll comes out, you can have these very small micro drones and fly them around without. Um, category two, uh, these are essentially four or five pound quad, uh, quad rotors. You'll see these like the Phantom two versions, threes, fours. Um, you'll see this is most ubiquitous. Um, they're greater than uh, 250 grams, uh, less than or equal to 1% chance of serious injury. The, fan, the manufacturer must certify the unmanned aircraft system exceeds the typical or likely impact and energy threshold or does not exceed <coughs> in accordance with industry consensus testing standards. The operator must comply with the manufacturer's operating um, operations manual, and they have to maintain a separation of 20 feet vertically and 10 feet horizontally. The industry consensus standards, which have to be promulgated still, there's none out there right now, but it will be before this rule goes into effect, essentially establishes a test for impact, energy, and problem failure modes, address impact or disposed parts, require manufacturer to provide overflight operations manuals, and define how the manufacturer needs to label its unmanned aircraft systems to comply with the standards. Category three, this is these are larger aircraft, uh, higher chance of probability of serious injury if they drop on your head. They're not allowing these aircraft to fly directly over crowds, so large gatherings of people's concerts and things like that, but will allow for limited operations or transient, transient um, operations across people or uh, in situations where the property owner allows it to happen and it's considered a closed set environment. Same certification operational requirements as category two. Category four is um, essentially allowing for sustained operations over crowds. This is what you're going to see in the future for um, looking at concerts or uh, sporting events and things like that and you have to submit what's considered a, a, risk, op, a risk mitigation plan to the FAA. The risk mitigation plan, again, which has to be um, developed at this point, um, is going to be considering the operator's qualifications, their training, their experience, um, commensurate with the increased risks that are based on the size of the platforms um, that you're flying. Uh, the method of approval and compliance with the plan, essentially you have to show the coordination with the FAA, the event sponsor, municipality, or local law enforcement. So much more detailed here in order to be able to fly over crowds. But if you can show that you're going to be safe and your platform has various um, risk um, uh, mitigation uh, uh, capabilities, then the FAA will allow this to happen. Again, we're expecting the direct overflight rule to come out in uh, this year. Again, quite a bit left to do before that happens. Category 2, 3, 4 requires self-certification by the manufacturer of the aircraft. Industry consensus standards still need to be established, and the risk mitigation plans still need to be uh, created and tested. Next stage applications going forward. Essentially, the future is now. You guys are part of that. We already see, I've put in red examples of where each one of these has been met technologically. Extended range or beyond visual line of sight, the Pathfinder um, and BNSF Railroad. Um, as well as the Vigilant and NASA programs. Both of those have proven concepts of det detecting a void in multiple aircraft in the same piece of airspace and communications autonomously without any intervention of human beings. And those have been handled at a variety of airports in uh, Nevada, New York, and uh, Texas. Um, also, uh, there's some other locations. But these have been proven concepts using small unmanned, unmanned aircraft systems. So they're there. Autonomous multiple drone operations. You've seen the Intel uh, 500 likely, where they've shown these light displays that have been all over the world now. Um, you saw most recently at the Super Bowl halftime um, show. Uh, that was essentially pressing the button, and these aircraft communicating with themselves, flying a uh, routine flight program, dealing with the wind and operator conditions of the particular aircraft, avoiding each other when they're being pushed together and staying in locations and flying as a swarm take off to landing, and it's just a push of a button. One operator is there to essentially take over as needed to have risk of mitigation um, uh, in case there's a flyaway or something like that. Package delivery to Domino's, and uh, Amazon Prime Air have already done it. Domino's did in New Zealand um, probably about six months ago now. 
when they did their first delivery of pizza. Amazon has already uh, proven their primary concept, um, delivering packages less than five pounds within 20 minutes in, um, in the UK. Um, and they've also uh, filed for a number of patents for risk corridors and things for operations in the United States. So it's going to happen. Cargo passenger drones, you think, that's yeah, not going to happen, it's going to happen. Okay, Boeing just came out recently, you might have seen the uh, Reuters on this. Um, it's also been a number of news media that have uh, talked about this. They're approving concepts in terms of artificial intelligence that they're going to be working on this summer. There's actually going to be pilots flying in aircraft this summer without touching the controls. Take off, um, cruise, landing, and risk um, uh, or uh, airborne avoidance of other aircraft. And they're first testing that this summer. So it's already there. Time is right. The FAA is encouraging commercial efforts. The avenues are available for commercial use. The building blocks of the technology, as I've explained, exist today. And those who are going to take the lead in using unmanned aircraft in a commercial sense uh, will be taking the lead in their industries. But there are challenges to expanded use on the legal side as well as the technological side. And I'm going to hand off to uh, Spencer to talk a little about some of the legal challenges that are preventing us from moving forward, at least at the moment. So what I want to talk to you about are uh, two different topics, um, legal challenges, if you will, or legal issues that need to be considered um, are one area we'll talk about is privacy, and then we'll talk a little bit about how federal preemption impacts the uh, growth of this drone industry. Um, with respect to privacy, and now Tom was talking to you uh, pretty much predominantly, if not exclusively, about FAA federal regulations governing safety and, and uh, equipment and so forth. Um, what I'm going to be talking about in terms of privacy is not coming down from the FAA, it's, and much of it is not coming from the federal government. It's coming from state and local laws. Um, and the reason for that is, we'll get, get in at the end, is, is the preemption issue, where federal law has um, uh, preempted state law in manner of air safety, but in privacy, it is left to the states and local municipalities to govern things like uh, privacy, law enforcement related issues. Um, and so one of the challenges for the drone industry um, to grant, gain critical mass and, and mass deployment is dealing with a set of disparate legal obligations and restrictions depending on what jurisdiction you're in. You can't depend that if you know one set of regulations around privacy that you're going to be um, satisfying those conditions everywhere you go, you're going to have to take into account local laws. There's no f single federal law on these issues that, that govern to make it uh, more standard. And the state laws are um, typically somewhat in line with one another, but there are enough variations that you need to be uh, aware of them. So, as a very basic rule of thumb that it's going to help you avoid liability, whether you're a recreational user or a commercial user, is, is, and this is somewhat common sense, but it's you don't photograph or collect data on individuals without their permission. Uh, there are exceptions to this, and there are especially, uh, this would not necessarily apply to media organizations. Uh, there's a sort of a different set of standards that apply because of First Amendment issues. But um, generally speaking, this would be a good rule of thumb. And if you are in an industry where you feel like you are going to need to be reporting and gathering information about individuals, then you'll want to do a deeper dive into some of these privacy laws. Um, just as an example here, there are, there's early adoption in some states of, of laws that are particularly focused on information gathering by drones. Uh, as you see, there's um, 26 states have, have passed drone-specific laws that deal with privacy or other safety um, issues, and uh, and uh, there's pending legislation in virtually all of the other states that touch upon a range of privacy matters. Um, so I'm just going to run through a few state examples of, of things that have been touched upon. For example, North Carolina passed a uh, uh, some legislation that restricts 
gathering personal information for the purpose of publicly disseminating it without the person's uh, or the owner's consent. This could include um, information about individuals. It could also include <coughs> information about private property or, or, or things that would um, lead or lend itself more towards the notion of trespass. Um, in Florida, for example, you can't observe um, people's conduct or movements or track them and uh, detect their habits. Um, there are certain exemptions under that law for mapping, agricultural use, utility inspections, and so forth. Um, there's a lot of legislation that's been enacted and others that's under consideration relating to voyeurism. I think this is probably one of the most obvious concerns that people have around the proliferation of drone uses. Are these things going to be peering outside my window or flying over my backyard? Or how, you know, is someone always going to be watching me? There is a lot of legislation that is um, directed towards that exact issue. And it's not the same in every um, state. And, and there are things, there are differences that pop up that you might not think about. Uh, for example, I saw just this morning there's some legislation pending in Indiana that would, um, if you are a registered sex offender, you have particular restrictions on using drones and recording information about people. Um, and there's a certain fine if you're uh, doing so uh, with respect to an adult, and there's a heightened fine and heightened penalty uh, if you're doing so with respect to children. So there's, in virtually every area of privacy that you can think of that already exists today, um, whether it's through just trespassing on property or spying on someone or reporting them without their consent or taking photographs or what have you, that is all going to work its way into the legal uh, scheme that governs the use of drones. Um, there's uh, several states have enacted laws that um, are protecting sort of the um, recreational hunting uh, community. So as you might imagine, there, there would be some um, environmentalists or animal rights groups that might want to uh, use drones to help get animals out of harm's way, while well, some legislation has been passed in, in hunting popular states where that kind of activity is prohibited. Um, they can't fly drones with the intent of scaring off the animals, or they can't report hunters um, that are lawfully hunting without their consent. Um, and so there are fines for that, those kinds of activities, depending on where you are. Uh, there's also, uh, there's another, uh, in Michigan, you can't, um, operated drone that would affect animal behavior, both from a hunting perspective, as well as um, disturbing livestock, for example, there's uh, some of those in Western states. There are restrictions on the type of equipment you can use to gather information and report in some states. So um, again, this is an early industry. Um, and the, the law in any new industry is always catching up with technology. And so you're getting laws that are being enacted right now that are sort of taking painting with a broad brush, and you'll probably see some refinement of these laws um, as the industry grows, as acceptance <coughs> of the uh, prevalence of drones and, and visual air, airborne technologies becomes uh, more routine. Um, from a privacy perspective, but as also as well, uh, it, it could be argued that this is somewhat of a safety issue. There are restrictions around where you can um, operate and uh, record uh, activities. So there are restrictions popping up in some states that limit the uh, proximity to government buildings or other sensitive areas, critical infrastructure, and so forth. And as I mentioned earlier, the bottom line is if you are going to be engaging in these kinds of activities, um, and there's certainly good commercial reason for doing so as, this, as the regulations evolve and permit that type of commercial activity, um, there will be industries surrounding that, that, that feature the gathering of information, whether it's film, whether it's um, uh, you know, taking recording images for, for real estate purposes and so forth. So there's a uh, real reason to engage in this kind of activity, and if you do, you're going to want to be checking the local laws. Just because the 
FAA does not preempt um, the field of privacy, it doesn't mean the federal government is not getting involved in privacy issues. So the federal government can also be regulating some privacy issues. The states can as well. If they have been preempting this field of privacy, then only the federal government would have the authority to do so. Um, so the, the, the Modernization Act, uh, FAA Modernization Act, has a special uh, uh, provision in it that calls for development of regulations governing privacy and data security. There is a set of voluntary guidelines that were issued a couple years ago by the National Telecommunications and Information Administration. Um, again, these are voluntary, but they are a good guidepost for where you might anticipate the legal regulatory scheme will, um, where we'll end up as, as laws become more standardized and, and proliferate for all the states. Um, so for right now, some of these best practices um, are, again, common sense, but others um, are co-opting privacy legislation that exists in, in other industries, for example, regulations around gathering uh, and, and securing and protected health information, uh, gathering and transmitting financial data, or other personally identifiable information. There's an entire um, very extensive legislative uh, scheme in all the states, in virtually all the states, that govern the, the collection, storage, transmission, use of this private, private information and sensitive information. If a, if a law, if a state has not enacted a drone-specific version of that, it doesn't mean you're not going to be governed by pre-existing legislation. If you are using um, uh, drone technology to gather information that would otherwise be covered by existing um, legal schemes, it, it doesn't call for a specific drone statute for you to be covered. So you, you're, you want to dive in depending on the industry you're in. Um, some of these best practices are, of course, uh, give notice to people who might be affected if you're flying over their land, um, if you're flying over a gathering as, as these possibilities become uh, available. Um, give notice, use reasonable care to, uh, uh, as you're operating drone and not causing unreasonable uh, risk and using also reasonable care in collecting and storing the data, using um, available technology to preserve its um, security and access from unauthorized people. Um, only use this data, these are, these are just good data storage and usage practices, generally. You want to limit what you are collecting, store it for only long, so long as you need to store it, and use it for limited purposes. Of course, if you get consent, if you get authorization from people that uh, uh, permit greater use or, or uh, commercial use, then that, that's fine. Um, what, as I mentioned, this, these best practices are voluntary. They are not mandatory. They do not have the effect of law. Um, and they do not take precedence over existing law, statutes, or ordinances and so forth. Um, as these best practices and guidelines start to proliferate, they can become a de facto standard. So um, it's important to watch what the industry is doing in terms of adopting best practices because as the industry starts to behave uh, in a particular way, if you're an outlier and not to those standards, you you don't agree with those. Um, so now let's talk a, a minute about preemption. Um, as I noted earlier, the FAA has a mandate to regulate unmanned aircraft operations um, and you know, safety, aviation safety. So this is not a field that states and municipalities have authority to regulate. 
doesn't mean they don't try to enact legislation that uh, encroaches upon the FAA's authority. And um, when they do, uh, those laws come under challenge, and then there is um, uh, a ruling that has to come out that determines whether it's the states have overstep their bonds. Um, I think that's about all we'll have for the preemption. And uh, we'll move on to technical challenges facing the industry. Yeah, the one thing, um, thank you very much. Yeah. The, um, the one thing on the, the preemption is that uh, they had an opportunity when they came out with this small UAS rule to, um, to specifically uh, say that uh, states can't um, pass uh, regulations or um, come up with bills that violate the rules of the FAA. And they didn't do that. And that, that brought a big concern. A lot of different people, different people have filed a lawsuit, et cetera. So they had an opportunity to specifically preempt state law, and they didn't do it. And so what it is, is essentially the state laws and municipalities are going out on their own, and they're creating laws out of thin air just based on what, the way they feel. Eventually, um, Congress is going to step in. And uh, it's going to happen at some point where Congress will say, this is the way it is. The states, some states, Arizona, and there's, there are a number of other ones, have actually taken it upon themselves and say, uh, if anything that we pass uh, violates uh, federal aviation laws, then uh, you know we can't do it. So the, the, F, the FAA, federal government, trumps us. And so we are preempting ourselves. The states have taken it upon themselves to make that move. But it will happen in the future. Um, uh, from a congressional standpoint. There are also technical challenges. Um, some of the most important technical challenges are endurance, uh, fuel and battery, uh, power and payload, and then lastly, autonomy. And I identified that with an asterisk, so that's key to going further than where we really are right now. In terms of endurance, it's primarily focused on rotor UAS, those that are the, like quadcopters and things like that, even very large size. The current LiPo batteries uh, allow essentially endurance anywhere between like 10 to about a half an hour. It's 10 to 15 minutes with some additional uh, uh, technological challenges there. But the constraints by existing fuel and battery charges, um, LiPo batteries, have essentially stopped their progress since the 1990s. Um, the auto recharging or the aircraft change out their own batteries, that all limits to things to localized short range operations. So when we're talking about drones right now, we're talking about things that are happening right here because we can't go any further. We don't have longer legs. We don't have the ability to go long range and operate for a long time without having to come back, change out the batteries, or have an auto recharge or some kind of technology that will help it do it on its own. So we're, stu we're stuck in the current local environment, at least as it relates to rotor aircraft. Some of the um, prospective solutions to that including include solar. You've seen those on some of the um, Intel aircraft, or the Google has an aircraft as well, Facebook has an aircraft, that they've proven these technologies stay aloft for a very, very long time with big solar panel, panels on those. But again, those are generally not rotor aircraft, those are generally fixed wing platforms, and they can stay long range for, for hours and hours, days, months at a time. That's great. If they can get it into a rotor aircraft, would be good as well. Um, hybrid fuel electric technologies are coming on board. Those are very promising as well as the improved fuel cell technologies. The fuel cells are most promising at this point, uh, but they do have their challenges in terms of um, shielding and capabilities um, in that regard. Uh, the power and payload, primarily relating to rotor UAS, um, future commercial demands will require more powerful uh, unmanned aircraft systems. Right now we're talking about small sensor suites smaller aircraft, but we need, if we want to go longer range, we have to have more fuel, more capabilities to carry things longer range, um, and heavier weight, so we need to fix that. Fixed wing platforms can do that, so we've already proven that these lighter weight fixed wing platforms, you get them airborne, you can carry very heavy loads, you can go longer range, longer endurance, but you can't do the precision operations that are required. So what some of the results are, again, low altitude, Limited operation ranges and limited <coughs> capabilities in terms of carrying heavier, heavier plat or heavier sensor suites. Some of the uh, solutions to that now technology, if we can make things smaller, then we have increased range or increased capability to carry heavier loads of fuel, heavier uh, uh, sensor suites on the aircraft. Hybrid fixed wing rotor designs, like you see the V22 Osprey, 
aircraft. Some of the other aircraft that Google is uh, looking at now, they've been testing in, um, in uh, Australia. They come up and they take off land vertically, heavier platforms. Improved propulsion and wing tow rotor technology is kind of like the Osprey, but also um, tying in um, other, other propulsion systems. <clears throat> But the greatest barrier to essentially ubiquitous use or expanded use of unmanned aircraft system really comes from their tether to human involvement. So the issue is we've got to get beyond where we are handling it, we're, we're, we're dealing with it, we're flying it ourselves. <clears throat> U.S. are currently restricted to visual line of sight low altitude, as I mentioned. The true integration of the national airspace system was required not just small aircraft, but all aircraft not operating within visual line of sight, but beyond visual line of sight or extended range. And altitudes, not at low altitude, but way up. Going from low altitude all the way up to um, 60,000 feet. That's going to require detecting and avoid our sense of avoid technologies. We must be able to see and be able to communicate. And the aircraft have to be able to do it to themselves as well. We have to have protocols for flyaway or any kind of interrupted loss link. And the current size and expense, even though we have these technologies in the military, the size and expense or the restriction to having those access to those technologies is preventing us from using them in the unmanned aircraft systems world. Some of the solutions to that, again, nanotechnology, improver, receiver, ADSB, technologies and sensor suites, radar, laser, electro-optical, and then excuse me, artificial intelligence is really going to be key here. And again, Boeing is already going to be testing some of these artificial technologies which exist in the military, but not in the civilian world. They're going to start working on that this, this summer. So right now, we only have a few minutes left, but I thought we'd open it up to questions and we hope we spark some interest. So if any of you do, please let us know. And it could be anything. Yeah. That kind of a beyond visual line of sight question, like, can it be like an internet connected PC somewhere with the camera on the drone, can that count as beyond visual line of sight, even if it's like crossing lines or, or what? Yeah, no, so they're not allowing you to, people to use like first person view right. technologies or anything to do that's not in the end eye. So right now you have to have a waiver unless you can visually see the aircraft. But they are allowing waivers for like daisy chains. So um, I'm here on the pilot of flying the aircraft, I can see it. I want to go further away, so I'm going to select you. You're going to be my visual observer. And then two miles further, it could be another visual observer. And as long as we're maintaining communications, we can show it's, it's a safe system. It's like a daisy chain. We can go extended line of sight or beyond visual line of sight. We already have waivers being granted under Part 107 by the FAA to do that, that same thing. But you can't use uh, first-person view goggles where you're putting them on, and you're, you literally can see where you're flying, but it's got to be the pilot without the first person view. Take those off. He's got to be able to see the aircraft in order to execute um, avoidance protocol so they don't hit other aircraft in the air. So just to be clear about that, if you have those on, you don't have line of sight. So you just have to be able to take them off and maintain line of sight. Yeah, but in those cases, anytime you're using first person view, you have to have a visual observer who so actually maintains somebody else has to be there. It's kind of an awkward situation, but yeah. that's true. And it's all getting to the point where, um, See these are the awkward situations. It doesn't make too much sense. Oh, yeah. So when they prove it's safe and first person view has all the backup redundancy and things that they need and no glitches, they're going to allow it to happen. But you can apply for a waiver right now and see if it'll work. I'm not sure if any first person views have received waivers yet. I've seen some promotional um, stills of, of um, goggles, yeah. but I always had someone else without them with the controls. That's so that right. makes that. that and that's what they're doing. Right. Because right. they're not allowed to do it just yet. Yeah. You talked about the farming application and that there was a waiver if the farmer is looking at his crops himself, but not if he gets to contract out that service. Right. At what point is the farmer doing a commercial operation? Because, I mean, if he's looking at his crops, he's doing it to save himself some money, right? Yeah, not necessarily because in, in that example by the FAA, the interpretation was someone's private property or private garden. So um, assuming that person isn't saying, I need to water these plants because they're getting dry, because now I need the product in order to sell commercially, um, as long as that's not the situation, he's just going to keep the product himself. 
it's okay. But he has to sell the product and he's, he's making the view in order to see that he needs water, okay, and to, to make sure the crop grows properly. And then he's going to sell the product at the end and that's not okay. That's good. That's considered for Yes, sir. Uh, simple question. How do you get a licensed pilot's license? Yeah, so to, oh, to get a pilot's license? Yeah. So they, it's like essentially 20 hours for, I think it's more of a recreational, 10 hours for the office, it's more of a record tape recreational, it's a 10, 10 hour ground hour flight um, training program plus grad school. So um, as long as you can do that at an airman certificate, you can use a, you can fly under section 333, and you have an airman certificate that allows you to do so. Um, those, uh, that's a good question. I don't know what it is anymore. I, I got my class a long time ago. But, uh, I, I love it. Uh, you know, I think I think it's probably like three to five thousand um, dollars to get your own certificate. Um, it's it's not that expensive. You just need to do the, uh, the the flight training is the more expensive thing after you have to maintain your qualifications and your currency and things. Yes, sir. One can easily imagine though, down the line where it would be safer to get people out of the software. Security does their clearance on drone operators as well, and that's going to become more and more 
important because there were people would take a, you know, a explosive and fly on a little dicky thing and fly it into a state building or they can fly it into here and kill a bunch of us. Um, so uh, it's going to be a big deal. And that's why you have to be done by the TSA as well before you get your, um, uh, you pass your knowledge test and get certificated. Uh, as it, it's called a remote pilot certification. For what weights? You know, over 55 or? Under 55. Yeah, under 55. Uh, if you're over 55, you actually have to be a pilot with an airman certificate, and as a result of that, you still have to be cleared by the TSA because you can't get a pilot certificate in the United States unless you are cleared. But that's that's pretty routine. It's, it's like over a half an hour. Yes, yeah. that's for the small unmanned aircraft system for Rule Part 107. Above that, you have to have a waiver under Section 333. Okay. What do you see in just from a realistic perspective in the aggregate and drones? How many of them are really complying, and how many of them are probably on the other side? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question because um, not, not a legal, not a legal yeah. opinion. Just a, I mean, no, I, I think it's it's always been identified as the number one area where it's going to be the most productivity, the most operators are going to be in the ag space, and that's from the very beginning because there's so much interest and there's so much capabilities and so much use that they can they can use these at, um, and uh, and they've proven that. It's, it's not one of the highest right now because it's, it's more difficult. You have to stay within visual line of sight and all this other stuff. But eventually it will open up and then farmers can use them just like crop dusting. Well, actually, they have unmanned aircraft with Dragonfly. They're going to create a Dragonfly. It's an unmanned aircraft system crop duster. And it's been flying um, proven with waivers. It's already operating. And they used the Yamaha um, uh, uh, crop dusting in Japan. That one now has a uh, certificate of authorization um, is an airworthy platform in the United States. So now people are using Yamaha, it's like a helicopter for crop dusting in the United States. It's already happening. Um, the whole issue uh, in agriculture why it's so important is you can do precision uh, water, you can do precision um, pesticide, and, uh, you know, um, you can do, you can identify in your area what needs, what spot needs what water, what spot needs to be harvested now, what spot. And you do this just by checking out the foliage and seeing how, how strong it is, how healthy it is. Then you use it with infrared camera, cameras and near infrared cameras if you want to um, The water table, where the plant thing, when the plant thing is, it's, it's remarkable what, what this technology is going to get. Um, but it's very, um, in, in terms of actually using it and having all these authorizations, it's a little bit different. I think a lot of operators are doing it without without getting waivers or compliance to do it. They're in the country and they're just... They're yeah, because the FAA doesn't have the ability to monitor these things. Right. And I, you know, I know the um, ex-FA um, head is uh, Jim Williamson, and, he, um, and, uh, and I've talked with him, and he says, you know, uh, we're not essentially of the inclination to go after people. We're not looking to go after farmers. Because a farmer over his own property, and it could be 300 acres or whatever, that's, that means that's not going to hurt anybody. It's not a safety risk. So they're not looking for somebody. But if somebody brings it to their attention, it's an expert farmer who wants to compete with you. Say this guy is using a drone. Um, they might give you a telephone call. They might send an email to you and say, stop, or show us that you're qualified and you have the authorization to do it. Uh, but most people are not doing it because you know, there's no safety risk. You know, there's no risk of any, of any injury or hurting any other Probably the most common issue would be when it's on the edge of uh, suburbia, right? You know, you yeah. Or, or it's competitive. I mean, you've got you know, Monsanto going against some other kind of you know, commercial okay. operation, and they don't want somebody taking pictures of their fields and so they can get data so they can create a better seed than, their, than Monsanto, for example. Um, or you're trying to compete with a next door farmer, um, and you don't want them to have that advantage. Um, you want, you know, and so if you see it, then they call it in and say, hey, check these guys out. But they might be qualified, but they already have their, their um, program set up. Any other question, guys? It's not the way. Now, is that the is that the weight of the unit or the capacity of the unit to load? Uh, it's the weight. It's gross weight of the unit with the with the um, with sensor on it. Right. With the payload on it. So if you change, you're going down over that limit. No, it has to be under the limit. Or well, I mean, yeah. Theoretically, yeah. As long as you're under the limit, you're good to go. That's part 107, section 333, which is the aircraft. And then that's been um, debated. But Section 333 is not as much of an issue because it's always higher heavyweight platforms. 
Anyway, so you have to have a waiver under Section 333 in order to um, fly with 55 pounds. So that means the platform plus anything else you put on is going to put you over that. But it's, it's the combination of the gross weight of the, the platform the and the sensors and everything else. And the payload that you're doing. Yeah. Spreading. Yeah. That's, uh, that's a, so that's right, it would change after. It would change. Yeah. Any other questions? Technology or that kind of stuff? Okay, well, thank you very much for your time, guys. It was a lot of fun. Thanks for having us down here.